All right, so it is 1.30, so I will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining the Woodland o Owner Webinar Series hosted by My St. Croix Woods, a program of the St. Croix River Association. My name is Nikki Hanger, and I am the Forestry Program Coordinator. The My St. Croix Woods program is a partnership of multiple public and private organizations throughout the watershed whose goal is to provide landowners with the resources and tools to make the best decisions on their land. All right, before we begin the webinar, I would like to take a few moments to talk about the Zoom software. Please leave your camera off and remain on mute for the entire webinar. You can type your questions in the chat at the bottom of the screen. Just click on that and it should just pop up. We will answer questions after both presentations, but feel free to type them throughout the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out in the next few days and will also be on the St. Croix River Association's YouTube channel. I also have a survey in the chat box. I'll put it in again for those of you who just joined. Um, please fill out the survey to help us determine future webinar topics and also to let us know how we are doing. Today's topic will be about how forests can help your local birds. But before I introduce our two great speakers, I wanted to highlight the next webinar, which will be held on January 13th at the same time and will be on agroforestry. We also have a save this date for the 2021 virtual forestry conference, which was sadly canceled in 2020 this year. All right, so our first presenter today is Jared Elm, who is a forest wildlife specialist with the Rough Grouse Society. This is a partnership position with NRCS, so Natural Resource Conservation Service, Wisconsin DNR, and Rough Grouse Society. He assists landowners with forestry assistance for habitat management with an emphasis on the federal farm bill programs. So I will let Jared take it away from there. And if you want to share your screen, Jared. Perfect. Okay, I can see your screen. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right, it took me a second. Um, and then if you could, yeah, just put it in presentation mode. All right. Perfect. All right, well, um, uh, as Nikki mentioned, my name is Jared Elm. Um, I'm a forest wildlife specialist with RGS. Um, I'm based out of Spooner, Wisconsin and, and cover the northwest part of the state here. Um, and today I'm going to just kind of give a rough grouse uh, 101 with an emphasis on um, private lands uh, and just a holistic look at, uh, at rough grouse. Um, based on my previous experience with St. Croix, um, it's probably a mix of private landowners and uh, natural resource professionals. Um, so I'm, it's just kind of a, a, a pretty general look at everything. So we're gonna talk about the basic ecology of grouse, uh, general population trends, um, Wisconsin young forest habitat. Um, as I mentioned, I am based in Wisconsin, so I have a, uh, a little bit of a bias to um, Wisconsin, but a lot of the same principles um, and statistics are pretty, pretty consistent with Minnesota as well. Um, and also talk about why private lands are vital to grouse and and some different uh, management strategies and um, advantages that private landowners have. All right, so rough grouse. Rough grouse are a upland non-migratory game bird. Um, they're actually the most widely distributed uh, upland game bird in North America. They're one of 10 native grouse species. Um, and they're about 15 to 20 inches long um, with two foot wingspan. Um, and they weigh one to one and a half pounds. Uh, you, know, you can think of them as a small chicken or about the size of a, a hen pheasant. Um, the term ruffed, uh, R-U-F-F-E-D, not uh, rough as in something rough or anything like that. It actually refers to um, a tuft of dark uh, long neck feathers. Um, as you can see in the graphic on the right, um, they, they generally puff them up um, when they're drumming, um, which we'll talk about drumming in a second. Um, there's two general color phases and tail fans, uh, gray and red. Um, the red on the top, the gray on the bottom. There's a lot, actually quite a bit of variation um, in that gray and red. Um, and we could probably talk about that all day if we wanted to. Um, 
but those are our general two color phases. Uh, gray are more common the farther north you get, especially into northern Minnesota. Um, and red is actually more common the farther south you get, especially into Appalachia. Um, where I'm located in the Spooner area, it's a pretty equal mix. Um, rough grouse are monomorphic. Um, basically, that means the males and females look, look very similar. Um, here's a kind of a graphic on how to tell males and females apart. Um, my favorite way and the, really the most sure way um, is on the rump feather of a grouse, um, which you can see in the upper middle part of the screen. Um, it will have one dot if it's a female, if you pluck a feather out, um, and then two dots um, will be a male. Um, you can also tell adults from juveniles based on their P9 or P10 um, wing feathers, um, which if you hold out the wings um, with its back up, that would be the, the uppermost two feathers. Um, if they're nice and rounded and uniform with the rest, it's an adult. If, if they're pointed um, and look a little shaggy, it's a juvenile. Um, rough grouse are um, well known for their drumming activities, um, which it, it kind of sounds like a an old tractor starting up in the distance um, in the woods. Um, a lot of people have probably heard rough grouse if you've spent much time in the upper Great Lakes, um, even if you've never seen one. Um, they typically drum to dis to establish mating and, and territory in April to May. However, grouse will drum pretty much all year um, and they actually drum quite a bit in the fall um, when broods disperse and they establish new territories. Um, they find, find a log, a rock, a stump, basically anything that elevates them um, to drum. They prefer utilizing slopes and vantage points where they can be heard from farther away. Um, so, you know, you can, if they would rather drum on top of a hill versus at the bottom or at the top of a valley where they can be heard from farther, it establishes a larger territory. Um, and it doesn't actually create a miniature sonic boom, but um, it does definitely has an uh, acoustic effect where when you're close to a drummer, you can, you can kind of feel the, the wing beats. Um, so just some basic grouse ecology. Um, grouse have a relatively um, small home range at about 10 to 20 acres. Um, they will disperse by as much as five miles if they do not have suitable habitat, but they, they generally in good habitat live in a relatively small area. Um, the Great Lakes population cycles on a nine to 11 year time frame. We see these big kind of booms and busts in grouse population, um, which is a relationship that's not really totally understood to this day. Um, there's a lot of theories on that, but uh, Generally, it's a nine to 11 year cycle. Um, grouse depend primarily on young forest habitat. Um, we'll kind of talk about what young forest is here in a minute, but um, you can, the, the graphic on the left there um, is, um, is a good example of what a young forest is. Um, they, they live out a lot of the late summer and fall through that habitat. Um, adequate cover is really the real limiting factor with grouse. Um, grouse are a habitat specialist uh, and that they rely on that young forest. So without that young forest, um, grouse have a really tough time getting by. Um, here's, uh, so, so young forest is a term that's used to describe dense stands of relatively young trees. Um, aspen clear cuts, uh, reverting field edges, uh, anything that's generally very brushy. Um, can kind of be referred to as a young forest. That's generally five to 20 year old trees. Um, these are created by logging or fire historically. Um, and uh, you know, commercial forestry is critically important um, in our landscape to create young forests just because uh, we, we really aren't able to implement a more historic fire regime. Um, very high stem densities is what really creates the structure um, that a lot of species of wildlife rely on. So as I mentioned, young forest, uh, you know, rough grouse are young forest specialists. There's a lot of other young forest specialists, um, such as woodcock, um, chestnut-sided warblers, snowshoe hares, um, a wide variety of songbirds. Um, and, you know, a, a habitat generalist would be the opposite of a specialist, and generalists would be things like white-tailed deer, turkeys, um, species that live in a, a wide variety of habitats that are um, less constrained by habitat type and more of the traditional food 
cover shelter. Um, so what is grouse habitat? So um, as I mentioned, drumming um, is an activity um, where they're courting. They like high small tree density, that very young forest, um, a high ground visibility layer where they can see a long ways away. Um, their nesting habitat where they nest in the spring um, is actually pretty variable. Um, hens actually will typically nest in a little bit older forest and nest up against a larger tree um, where they can see out a long ways. Um, and brooding, um, brooding is really the one of the limiting factors for rough grouse. Um, they like those really dense stands uh, once again and especially stands with a really um, diverse herbaceous layer with a lot of different flowering plants. Um, those chicks rely primarily on insects um, and they they need a lot of different uh, flowering periods to provide a wide variety of insects. Um, those stands are five to 20 years old. They also utilize wetland habitats such as tag alder quite a bit in that time period. Um, for foraging and winter forage, um, they typically like a little bit older uh, stands, especially aspen stands. Um, their average foraging age is roughly 36 years. Um, and in the winter, they're eating the buds of aspen, uh, birch, ironwood, um, basically any type of high protein catkin or tree bud um, that they can get a hold of that's not buried by a bunch of snow. Um, they also winter roost and that they snow burrow. So they need um, eight inches to a foot of relatively light powdery snow. Um, so that's snow that's not uh, wind blowing or icy. Um, and they'll actually create a small burrow uh, into the snow um, where they can get away from predators, but they also are really good at thermoregulating um, within their snow <clears throat> burrows to keep warm. Um, here's kind of a graphic that explains um, the different time periods in which grouse will especially utilize aspen. Um, so that brood cover is those very young young cover um, with 10,000 stems to the acre. Uh, breeding cover is a little more variable. Um, nesting cover is extremely variable as you can see. Um, the winter feeding use is right at that 36 years of age. Um, but that, that brood cover is really in that 10 years or younger aspen stand. Um, and just to illustrate how important aspen is to rough grouse, um, here's kind of an overlay of the rough grouse range uh, with an overlay of the aspen range in the United States. Pretty, pretty closely correlated. Um, with that, here's some, we'll talk a little bit about um, how we're doing on habitat uh, and, and keep in mind that that dense cover is the limiting factor for rough grouse. So once again, this is a Wisconsin, more Wisconsin-centric presentation. Um, but since 1983, we've actually lost uh, 1,286,000 1, acres of young forest habitat, while we've simultaneously gained 1.7 million acres of um, total forest land. So that's land that has been um, either old fields growing back to trees or pine plantation. Uh, reforested sites. So we've actually been gaining a lot of forest land, um, but we're losing um, young forest habitat simultaneously. So even though we are gaining more acres of forest, um, we aren't doing maybe as good of a job of managing that for forest base that we already have. Uh, and here's kind of a graph of how that plays out throughout the, throughout the state. Um, this is FIA data, which is the forest inventory and analysis data that's pre prepared by the U.S. Forest Service, um, which they have fixed plots where they kind of get an idea of how, our, uh, how the succession of our forest is going and what our species composition is. Um, you know, you can see a pretty precipitous decline um, from 1983, which was kind of the heyday of rough grouse in the upper Great Lakes uh, and even the driftless as well. Um, and you can see in the early 2000s, we actually kind of started to um, flatten out a little bit. Um, we had some more opportunity in Aspen markets, um, more market opportunity to create young forest habitat um, that came about. And you can see how closely correlated uh, markets often have with, with rough grouse and forest uh, habitat. 
Um, here's a, this is also FIA data that illustrates kind of how the, um, how our Aspen age classes are distributed on private uh, county, state, and national forest land in Wisconsin. Um, and really the biggest takeaway from this is um, a lot of our public land managers are hanging in there and um, creating quite a bit of young forest habitat. But, um, you know, at 60 years of age, aspen trees really start to senesce and um, die and convert to other forest types. Um, so in that 60 to 80 year old age class, if you look at that private land um, data, we have a ton of really old aspen on private land here in Wisconsin. Um, and really by that 80 to 100 year old cohort, um, that's so small because at that point, the aspen stands have generally converted to a different forest type, mostly northern hardwoods. Um, and oak forests are also critically important, especially in northwest Wisconsin and southwest Wisconsin um, that have a really large oak base. And um, this is a little bit of more complicated issue to look at, but um, when you look at that private data um, for that 60 plus year old oak and especially that 90 plus year old oak, um, we have got a lot of really old oak forests that um, really at that 100 year old age class is also converting to a different forest type. Um, and oak is a lot of times pretty brushy habitat and uh, often overlooked um, for rough grouse habitat too. Um, so that's kind of why I threw it in there is, you know, it's, Aspen is obviously critically important, but how Aspen interfaces with some of our other um, forest types is also important and something worth looking into. Um, so now we'll kind of move on to some of the, the private lands um, information. So what are some of the challenges for grouse on private land? Um, you know, many private landowners uh, face quite a, few obstacles that are not really commercial in nature, um, but usually it kind of boils down to where do I start? You know, whether you're a new landowner or a newly, you newly inherited a property, or maybe you've owned forest land for quite a while and just never really given much thought to, um, you know, the land that you own, it's always just kind of there. Doesn't seem like very many things change year to year. Um, or maybe you've owned the land for a while and now you're just at a stage in life where you're able to spend more time out there. Um, that question can come at many different times and I, working with private landowners, um, I find people in all different stages, everywhere from, I just bought this or I'm thinking of buying it to we've owned this for 50 years and I think we wanna do something different. Um, you know, small parcels are also a big issue. Um, for private landowners, obviously the larger land base you own, um, the easier it is to get commercial work done, but you also have a bigger, bigger canvas to um, play with, which sometimes can be a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Um, we also see a lot of fragmentation and land transferring hands, um, especially when you look at some of the average uh, uh, landowner ages, there's gonna be a massive transfer of land um, in the next 20 to 30 years, you know, pretty much nationwide in the United States. Um, and the allure of fragmenting that or selling it to somebody else is, is pretty strong a lot of the times. Um, and, you know, hopefully if, um, you know, we're able to help people out, we can, we can keep some of these larger blocks intact. Uh, the graphic on the right is actually just a few miles from my house um, in Spooner, um, which was a 160, um, I think it is, uh, just a few years ago, um, the landowner, it was an MFL open. The landowner died, uh, purchased by a developer. Um, it's actually not very far from the St. Croix River. Um, and you can see how they kind of built some roads, carved it up, and um, are building a whole bunch of houses. That is, you know, basically a land use conversion at that point, And that's not good um, for rough grouse or any forest wildlife for that matter. Um, but there are some distinct advantages to private forest lands. Um, northern landowners, both in Minnesota uh, and Wisconsin, um, actually have pretty good access to markets. Um, we've obviously seen some market volatility um, this year, um, no different than any other industry. 
um, but compared to the rest of the country, um, we actually have it have it pretty good. It's easy to be doom and gloom, but we have good pulp markets, which is what a lot of aspen and other timber types that are um, even age management or more clear cutting activities. That what a lot of what that wood is used for is pulp, which are um, you know, paper, um, OSB, um, plywood, things like that. Um, we also have a lot of loggers and uh, private consulting foresters that specialize in private lands. Um, and mills readily purchase and accept private wood. Um, most uh, private landowners also have pretty diverse forest types. Um, you know, it's pretty rare that I walk a, a piece of property with the landowner where they, um, they have just one solid um, forest type, whether it's oak or just aspen. Usually it's a, a, a pretty mixed bag, which you know, it creates some diversity and management options and um, you know, allows uh, some creativity um, to be implemented too when, when creating forest habitat. Um, there's also a lot of financial and technical assistance from you know, places like uh, NRCS, DNR, uh, NGOs like Rough Grouse Society and American Bird Conservancy. Um, and there's recently been a pretty big push um, on engaging uh, private landowners as well. Um, and yeah, private landowners can also really intensively manage small properties. So, um, you know, when you're managing a national forest at, you know, maybe a couple million acres, um, that's really hard to manage, um, you know, each stand um, maybe as intensively or monitor stands as intensively as you want. Um, but if you say you own an 80 um, and you're out there all the time, um, you can really take notice of uh, the little things that a lot of times go uh, unnoticed on, on public land. Um, so you can really intensively manage small properties um, when they're smaller and um, you've got the willpower to do so. Um, so some of my tips for private landowners too is to understand what you have, uh, have a good, forest management plan um, and also be realistic with what you have. Uh, you can't make a property something that it's not. So, you know, everybody, uh, you know, I find a lot of landowners want, you know, something out of their property that uh, it's just not realistic, whether it's having more oak or having a beautiful pine stand, you know, you can move in that direction, but um, a lot of sites just don't lend themselves to be something um, that they're not. Um, also updating and keeping a dynamic plan, things change. Um, so if you, get a, if you get a plan that's not set in stone, that's a, that's a living, breathing document. Um, another pitfall I see with private landowners is um, not being very clear with your goals. Uh, I see a lot of goals like uh, manage for wildlife and um, enjoy the recreation. Those are, those are pretty generic and quite frankly, we can't really, really do a whole lot with that. Um, but some goals like I want to diversify uh, my Aspen age classes. Um, the graphic on the right is a, a plan that I wrote for a private landowner um, who had a, he, he had a 40 of, of Aspen, which is relatively uncommon. But he's like, man, I got my plan and it says I got to clear cut it all in one go. What should I do? Um, so it's like, well, uh, you know, if he had been more clear with this consultant that wrote the plan, um, that he wanted to diversify that base, he might have been able to to have the plan on the right uh, the first go around. Um, you know, some other ones regenerate oak, um, uh, maintain large white pine. You know, those are pretty clear things that when a when a landowner or a consultant or forester picks up that plan, um, you know, those are those are pretty tangible goals. Um, also, reach out to professionals. There's a lot of free help uh, out there, um, and people willing to give you some ideas and and get you started in the right uh, right direction. Um, and everybody's uh, always willing to help you out. Um, and also keep in mind, people have been pretty intensively managing our landscape for, for hundreds of years. Um, doing nothing is just as active a management decision as uh, doing something, um, especially when it comes to timber harvest. Um, so with that, I'm uh, close to my time, um, but I just kind of wanted to leave a quote that I, I think about a lot from all the Leopold. Um, and uh, really the takeaway from this is the grouse represents only a millionth of either the mass or the energy of an acre, yet subtract the grouse and the whole thing is dead. 
Um, basically what Aldo is saying is that uh, rough grouse are the real bell bellwether um, and a critical indicator of our overall forest health um, because they are a habitat specialist and they are so uh, visible and noticeable in our landscape and in our woods. Um, and when the rough grouse disappear, it's a it's very much an indicator and a sign that something else is is going awry. Um, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine. Um, so that kind of wraps up my presentation here. So I'll uh, I'll hand it back over. Great, thank you, Jared, for that great information. Before we get to our next presenter, I want to remind everyone that if you do have a question, please use the chat box. And I see that some of you already do, so that's great. We will have a Q&A session at the very end of the next presentation. So our next presenter today will be Dwayne Fogart, who has been working in the field of forestry for over 20 years. For the last five, he has been with the American Bird Conservancy. His current efforts are working with the NRCS, helping forest land owners manage their land for wildlife. And Dwayne, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen now. Um, perfect. Okay, how does that look? Yes, it's great. Thank you. Okay, so as was said, I'm Dwayne Fogart. I'm a forester with the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, I work basically in northeastern Minnesota out of Duluth. So this, this will kind of complement Jared's a little bit because a lot of this is going to be focused more on Minnesota. But again, it applies to a lot of the areas in the lake states pretty, pretty much across the board. And I'm going to start off with a really quick and dirty history of the forests of northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, this is going to be really fast. I'm going to cover about 12,000 years in maybe five minutes. So it's going to be pretty surface, but I'll do the best I can here. So uh, the main thing we got to talk about to begin with is uh, the ice ages. Uh, there was so, several ice ages that affected Minnesota and Wisconsin, but the, the main one is... Uh, the Wisconsin glaciation that uh, started about 100,000 years ago and ended 10 to 12,000 years ago, depending on which area you're talking about. Uh, pretty much affected all of Minnesota and Wisconsin, except for the Driftless area, which of course is quite famous for, for not having been affected by it. And after the ice left, um, Minnesota and Wisconsin was basically a tundra. It looked a lot like this, there was no trees. Uh, the trees took a while to come in, but there was people, as Jared kind of alluded to, this, this is kind of hard to see this, but this is an archaeological site up in the Boundary Waters of Minnesota. It was a stone quarry where people cut pieces of stone for arrowheads and axe heads and other tools, and it's been dated to about 10,000 years ago. So people were here before there was forests, so that's an important thing to keep in mind that the forests in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin have been affected by people from the very beginning. And one of the main things that affected forests was fires. Uh, lightning started fires and you know when there was nobody here to put it out they just burned until they went out. Uh, the, the people, the Native Americans also used fire as a management tool to uh, clear the brush out in the forest and make it easier to travel through and to manage for blueberries and other uh, things that they wanted to eat and for game animals that they wanted to hunt. Uh, this, you can't, it's kind of hard to see, but this was a study that was done in Itasca State Park in Minnesota. They were able to use tree rings to reconstruct the fire history from 1712 to 1913. And during that time frame, there was a fire somewhere in the park about every nine years. A uh, major fire that burned a significant part of the park about every 10 years and any one spot in the park on average burned over about every 22 years. So that's a lot of fire. Uh, this obviously is not Minnesota or Wisconsin, but you can see on that sequoia, you can see that huge fire scar and uh, you know, that kind of drives home the point. There hasn't been a fire in this area in at least 100 years, but that fire scar is still huge. And when you look close to it, and it, you can see that it's actually numerous, dozens, maybe hundreds of fire scars piled one on top of it another. There was, you know, there was fires burning through there all the time before 
fire suppression kicked in. And uh, well, here's one of Jared's coworkers from the Rough Grouse Society pointing out how important fire is that, you know, much in North America, the forests are a fire forest, kind of like the rainforests of South America are rainforests, so. So after a fire, you know, we'll talk about succession. You know, after right after you have a fire, you know, it's basically the first things that come in are, are grass and forbs and stuff like that. And then gradually woody uh, shrubs and things move in and then eventually goes towards trees. And there's different kinds of wildlife that use each of those different habitats. You know, example of this, I mean, I work for the Bird Conservancy. So here's four warblers that are native to North America. And in the lower left is golden wing warbler, which nests in young forest and brushland. And upper left is a black and white warbler, which nests in what we call the stem exclusion phase, which is kind of the early part of middle-aged forest. And then the black-throated blue warbler is in the upper right when the forest gets a little bit older and the, and the understory starts to come back in again. And then Canada warbler in the lower right, which uh, mainly nests in older forests. So, I mean, the, the fact that these bir different birds evolved to use the different habitats that were available, you know, shows, you know, what was going on there, that we basically had a, a mosaic of different types and ages of forests prior to Europeans coming in. And when Europeans came in that, you know, that started with the big logging of the big pines and then, you know, settlement, people came in and tried to far farm these areas after the loggers were done. And involved in that was, a, again, a lot of fires, although these were much bigger and more catastrophic fires, the, the Peshtigo fire in Wisconsin, the Hinkley fire, Cloquet fire in Minnesota. Uh, big fires that burned in the slash left over from the pine logging and that people wanting to farm started fires to, to help clear the land. And, and so most of the area burned over at some point or another during that time frame. And this was a really, you know, short time frame. Uh, like in the St. Croix Valley, there's still water was founded as a logging and sawmill town in the middle of the eight, middle 1800s. Uh, and most all the forest was logged off by the by 1900 so it was about 50 years and that's actually like in northeastern minnesota where i usually work the big logging started in the 1880s and was done by 1929 when the last sawmill shut down so 50 years is a pretty short period of time for that much change and so what we ended up with was a forest that was a lot simpler and uh more even aged with a lot fewer age classes age class diversity and it in many areas dominated by aspens and birch which are early successional species that that come in quickly after a fire so there that was a real quick little uh run through the history of it and so then the, i'm gonna kind of just throw out some ideas for projects landowners can do to try to help bring some of that diversity back to their land and uh you know, these are projects that, that can be scaled up or down to be done, you know, at, at a big level if you have a contractor to do it or at a small level, you can just do it yourself. Okay, the first one is planting trees. Um, obviously, I'm a forester, so I like trees and uh, planting trees is a great thing to do, especially if you have old fields or something like that that you want to reforest. Um, of course, you have to keep in mind that the trees take a long time to grow so you don't get really quick results and if there's a lot of deer around or rabbits or other animals that like to eat trees you got to protect them so uh that can be kind of a, a long and and time consuming process a uh, faster thing is to plant fruiting shrubs um that's what these people are doing is planting fl fruiting shrubs in an old field and uh, you'll notice though that they're not planting them uniformly, they're planting them in like clumps and leaving areas of grass and and that's a, a more natural, so to speak, way to do it. That'll create a more diverse habitat than if you just plant them evenly over the site. Uh, an example of a fruiting shrub is this is a high bush cranberry. Uh, you know, that's another advantage of them is they're, they're kind of pretty when they bloom. And then high bush, 
bush cranberry especially hold on to their berries until something eats them so they'll have berries on them way into the winter and so a lot of birds ruffed grouse being one of them will feed on these even after you know there gets to be quite a bit of snow on the ground and there's not nearly as much food available okay so we're kind of back to succession again another thing you can do is what we call a feathered edge now this succession we were talking about it earlier is is the change in in uh, vegetation over time but you can also do it over space uh, kind of almost exactly recreate this picture where you have a older forest and younger forest and grasslands and stuff across a, a piece of land uh, this what he, right here is what we call a hard edge where it goes basically directly from a from grassland to a fairly mature forest in a very short distance. The idea with feathering an edge is to make that that transition area, that edge, a lot wider. A lot of wildlife actually uses edge. White-tailed deer is probably the most famous example. Um, but there's a lot of wildlife that actually prefers that transition area between different habitats, that edge. So here's a couple things you can do. Uh, you can see on the on the left hand side that's a power line right away and what the landowner has done is cut the trees back in places and you can see that there's brush and golden rods and and young trees sprouting up and uh you know it's kind of broadening that that edge of what otherwise would be a pretty hard edge on the right hand side it's it's the driveway going into their property and again they've cut some of the bigger trees back but you can still see you know there's some big trees there's some small trees there's a some winter berry there coming in that's got the red berries on it and some aster flowers, you know, for the pollinators. So it creates a lot more diversity of, of vegetation and habitat for different kinds of wildlife. A lot of us, when we think of a forest, we think of something like this. I mean, this is what people like where you have the big trees and basically nothing underneath it. So it's easy to walk through. Um, but generally this is not what, you know a forest is supposed to look like uh, you know a few maybe like pine forests that have frequent ground fires in them might look like this but generally speaking fires should look more like or a forest should look more like this they should have multiple layers of uh, of brush and young trees and big trees and medium-sized trees and and all those different layers of vegetation create habitat for for different species of birds especially So one thing you can do is you can thin your forest, uh, cut some of the bigger trees and open up some growing space for some new stuff. Um, you can also do it, if you do it in a non-uniform manner, so you open up gaps in the forest, you can get you know, a lot more diversity that way. You can see this landowner actually had cut some trees earlier and that's where those you know, young trees in the middle are coming from and then they, they freshly cut some, some of the bigger ones around the outside to kind of make the gap bigger and let another flush of growth, growth come in. Uh, when you do stuff like that, uh, one of the things you can do is pile the, the material that you've cut into brush piles or just leave it laying on the ground as coarse woody debris. Uh, they, they're not the prettiest looking thing, but a lot of wildlife uses brush piles uh, when they're fresh you know it attracts a lot of small mammals like rabbits and mice and of course where you have rabbits and mice you're going to have foxes and bobcats and stuff that hunt them as the the wood kind of rots down it attracts in, insects and there's a lot of insect eating birds so you'll get birds coming in there to eat those insects and then as it continues to rot down uh, amphibians a lot of amphibians live in rotting wood and so you can end up with your frogs and your salamanders and stuff like that. Kind of changing topics. To, if you're trying to imitate a, an older forest, one of the things you can do is put up nest boxes because that's one thing many of our forests are missing is big trees that have hollows in them for animals and, and birds to nest in. Uh, on the left hand side here, we got a barred owl box with some young barred owls and and on the right, there's a Martin box with a family of Martins. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it for me. We can, you know, start the Q&A if you'd like.
Great. Yeah. Thank you both Dwayne and Jared for speaking with us today. If you haven't um, done so already, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. And also there is a survey that if you take could help us plan our future webinars. So I will start moderating the questions, but we will we may not be able to get to them all. If you have questions that we were not able to get to, please feel free to email me and I can connect you to the right contact. All right, so I will start with questions for Jared since Dwayne, you just spoke to give you a little break. Um, the first question is, um, for grouse habitat, what about, you know, you talked about density being important. Is buckthorn or prickly ash, like does it matter what is making up that density? Um, that's a, when it comes to invasives, that's kind of a million dollar question. And I think it, to some extent, it kind of depends on uh, where you're at uh, in the landscape. I'm certainly no lover of uh, buckthorn and prickly ash is actually a native that exists in a kind of artificial density from previous grazing activities. Um, you know, but the reality is I think in some areas we almost have to accept that buckthorn is uh, going to become almost naturalized to some extent. Um, but I don't really see buckthorn at a stem density to where I would say it's ideal young forest habitat. So I guess that's where I'd, I'd land on that one. So get rid of it. Yeah. And then kind of a follow up, um, does prickly ash have any have a very limited wildlife value? Um, it's a native citrus plant actually and it, it definitely has uh, some wildlife value for um, uh, rabbits and uh, hares and um, it does pr produce a fruit that wildlife use and um, so it, it definitely it definitely does but uh, you know it, like I mentioned it's it exists at kind of artificially high densities and um, I usually say if, for folks, if it if it prevents you from enjoying your woods like you would like to enjoy it, uh, go ahead and, and get rid of it. Great. Um, here's kind of a more specific question. So in this person's latest MFL timber sale, um, they had specific wildlife benefits at schools, but the loggers cut almost all the ironwood down. Um, why are they targeting them when they benefit several species? Um, so uh, when we look at regenerating a new age class of trees, ironwood and musclewood or uh, blue beech or hornbeam, it's also called, um, it is basically a, a mid-story tree in that it produces a lot of shade. It can live in the, the understory um, and if you remove the overstory, such as, you know, you see a lot of ironwood and oak stands. Um, if you're trying to regenerate oak and you remove the oak to give your oak seedlings a lot of sunlight, but you leave the ironwood, um, that's going to shade out your oak seedlings too. Um, and ironwood and musclewood don't really have a commercial value. So, um, frequently it's written in, written into a timber sale prescription to, um, remove all the ironwood, um, basically so you're getting full sun to your oak seedlings and giving them the best chance to to sprout. Um, I actually have quite a few projects where we remove ironwood and musclewood prior to a oak um, timber sale um, to prepare that seed bed to regenerate oak. So um, it kind of falls into that same category with uh, prickly ash as well is that we have ironwood at a somewhat artificial density um, because cattle didn't eat it when our woods were fairly grazed. I mean, it exists at an artificially high density. So um, there are a lot of plants that I kind of call uh, vodka plants, like thistles, um, ironwood, uh, prickly ash. You know, a little bit of them uh, is probably not such a bad thing, um, but a whole lot of it is uh, is not a good thing, um, just like vodka. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, this is a clarification question. Does harvest, when you're talking about har harvest in your presentation, mean clear cut or selective harvesting? Uh, both. Um, so I find that those terms mean uh, very different things to uh, different people. Um, so to me, a clear cut could be as small as an acre, but I find a lot of people when they think of clear cut, um, they think of uh, 200 acres being uh, harvested at once. Um, so, but some people think of, you know, a one or two acre clear cut or a small clear cut as a selective cut, um, which isn't, um, isn't really a, 
true either. So it's tough to say. I would say that those terms generally aren't used a whole lot by foresters just to avoid the confusion of them. Um, so I was talking a little bit about both. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then this I think could be answered by either of you guys. Um, how wide should a feathered edge be? I'll take that one. Uh, the wider the better, generally speaking. Uh, it depends a lot on how much space you have. Like those pictures I had where people were working with the edges of their driveway or the edges of a power line coming into their property. You often don't have a lot of space, but if you have more space and you're mainly concerned with wildlife and, and you're not deeply concerned with uh, you know, having an eventual commercial timber sale, you can make it 100, 150, even 200 feet wide. So, you know, it depends a lot on, on what you're trying to do and what, how much space you have. Mm -hmm. um, and then following up, so for managing for deer, I know you talked about feathered habitats being good for both. Is it good for grouse and turkey? Uh, feathered edges that we're talking about? Um, maybe, I think maybe just if you manage for deer, is it good for grouse and turkey as well? Um, uh, well, deer management and grouse management usually go pretty well together because they both like a, you know, a significant portion of young forest and then some older forest, you know, the deer will use for, uh, for bedding sometimes and depending on what type of forest it is. And, you know, that as Jared talked about, the grouse will, will feed in the wintertime on the buds of older aspens and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, turkeys generally, they're more of a generalist. So they, you know, they, they especially like, you know, some older forest, it's, it's oaks that provide some acorns, uh, some openings and some fields. Uh, often, you know, cornfields and stuff they'll use, uh, you know, pastures where they'll, uh, They'll peck the the seeds out of the the cow pies, you know. Uh, so you know, turkeys are are pretty generalist. They can use most anything if there's something for them to eat, I guess. Thank you. Um, the grouse hunting season for Wisconsin was shortened due to concern about low grouse numbers. There was concern about disease. Um, do you know the status of it now? Uh, well, the hunting we. The season now closes at the end of December, which is in our updated uh, Wisconsin uh, grouse management plan. In regards to West Nile virus, um, this is actually the third and final year of a, a three-year testing process in Minnesota, um, Michigan, and Wisconsin of hunter harvested birds. Um, and a lot of that information um, is both on the state agency websites as well as the Rough Grouse Society websites if you want to uh, kind of look at the percent of, of um, birds impacted. Really what we're looking for is uh, trying to figure out how many uh, healthy birds contain antibodies, which indicates that they have lived through it and are potentially passing on uh, antibodies to offspring. Great, thank you. Um, is there any advice for improving habitat to attract spruce grouse? Uh, I can take that one. Uh, spruce grouse are really strongly connected with what they call the short needles conifers, the spruces, uh, jack pine, balsam. Uh, so if you have that on your landscape, you know, you want to try to maintain them if you can, unless they're getting too old. You know, jack pine's not a very long-lived tree, so it's harder to hold that on the landscape. Or if you, uh, you know, don't have it, or if you want to do like a timber sale or something, if you try to do something to encourage short needled conifers in the new forest, uh, planting or soil scarification to, to give a seed bed for the seeds to, to get going. Uh, so yeah, basically anything you can do to encourage dense stands of short needled conifers is, is what spruce grouse like. Thank you. Um, this question is, I have dense woods with mostly older trees, but almost no understory plants. How do I determine best way to open the forest to encourage new growth? Um, get in touch with a, a forester, um, whether a, a state uh, agency forester or depending where you're located. If you're located in northern Wisconsin, you can contact uh, me or if you're located in Minnesota, you can contact uh, Dwayne and I'm sure we can get you in the right direction. But I would recommend getting in touch with the forester. Yeah, I guess I would add to that, 
you know, your local uh, soil and water conservation district office or uh, your DNR private lands forester or uh, a consulting forester if you can find it or, you know, I mean, that's probably the best way to go. Uh, yeah, if, if anybody would like to contact me, I can put my email address on here and I may not be able to help you personally, but I can probably put you in touch with someone who can. Great, thank you. Um, what is the preferred habitat to, to develop to increase population of timber doodles? Yeah, timber doodle is a <laughs> nickname for wood, American woodcock. Mm. Um, woodcock like really, really uh, young forests, um, you know, about five to seven year old um, stands and generally woodcock like um, wetter sites, um, especially wetter aspen sites because they feed on invertebrates. Um, and they also like uh, clear cuts that are a little bit bigger. Um, so it, uh, depending on how your property lays out and um, you know, identifying some wetter aspen stands and maybe cutting them a little bit bigger than you normally would is um, a, a, a decent start. Um, another question is, will high bush cranberry be able to stay ahead of buckthorn evasion? Um, I, they plan on removing buckthorn um, but the seedlings, you know, are very aggressive. Yeah, uh, well, I hate to keep saying this, but it depends. But uh, if, you, if you're cutting the buckthorn back down to the ground and, you know, maybe if it's, if it's not too much of it, you can apply some herbicide to the cut stumps and, and help kill it that way. But if you cut it back to the ground and then plant something like highbush cranberries, uh, you know, the, the high bush cranberry will compete fairly well with, you know, just the buckthorn seedlings and sprouts coming up. Although, you know, if there's a lot of sprouts, they do grow pretty fast. You might have to do some release work where you go in with like a brush saw or something, you know, a year or two after you plant the, the cranberries and, and mow the brush, the buckthorn around them, like in a little circle around them to, to you know, give them another leg up. Mm -hmm. All right, so a few more questions. Um, so this is kind of a long one. So this person took a day class with Gordon Gullion, not sure if I'm saying this correctly, at the University of Minnesota's Forestry Research Center up in Cloquet. Um, how closely is his research being used in modern day rough grouse management? Uh, very closely. Some of the graphics I use are actually from Gordon Gillian. Um, so, you know, really, uh, so a lot of his research that uh, he was working on before he died, the, the book hasn't really been closed on some of those questions. Um, so we definitely still use his research very much so. Um, and a lot of the questions he left with, uh, we are also kind of left with as well and haven't really figured out. So um, very influential to rough grouse and uh, rough grouse society. Um, this uh, landowner has a question about their beavers ran out of aspen and now are girdling oaks and other hardwoods. Um, how bad is this? Oh, I can try that one. I mean, you know, I guess it, how bad is it depends on what you're wanting. Uh, usually they can't, they can't survive very long on, on trees like that. So they'll probably die out if they don't have any more aspen or alder or something to eat on. Uh, if it's fairly young oaks, they will re-sprout from the roots after their the beavers eat them. If it's older ones, they may not. So, you know, if you if you want to maintain your big trees, then I guess it's bad. If if you want to, you know, have some disturbance and some and some some early successional habitat coming in, then it's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is just kind of a comment to further the buckthorn discussion. Um, this person says, I think common buckthorn is a sink habitat for pretty much everything. I've never seen a paper that documented a positive effect on any wildlife species. So, um, Other than that, I do not think, oh, was there another question? Um, yes, one more just came in. So she is interested in putting up an owl house. Um, where can you get one of these um, owl houses? And then also, yes, yeah, do great horned owls use these? As far as I'm aware, great horned owls don't use owl houses. Uh, barred owls do and screech owls do. Those are the, probably the two most famous ones that will use artificial houses. Um, you can buy them, you know, Google it on the internet 
or you can build them yourself. There's a lot of plans out there for building them. Uh, screech all one might be easier to start with because they're smaller. Uh, a barred all house is really big and putting it up in a tree can be a dangerous activity. So, you know, that might be something to, to, you know, practice with a, a screech all house for a while and houses for a while before, and then maybe do a barred all house later. Great, thank you. Um, I don't believe, oh, one more just came in. Um, I believe Gordon and Gullion recommended removing scattered pine in an aspen forest because hawks hiding in pines and swoops down on grouse. Is this a concern? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, in my opinion, I think it depends on what density um, the pine is at and also what uh, species of pine um, so a scattering of jack pine, for example, I kind of like uh, leaving jack pine. That creates some good thermal cover. Um, however, a, a pretty dense stand of, um, you know, white pine, um, you know, could potentially be predator perch. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a, a complicated question. I guess I would, I would leave that at. And it's very, very site specific. Mm -hmm. um, another question that came in, I think we only have time for just one or two more. Um, my older aspen are dying out in a wetter area of my land, but nothing seems to be filling in. Is there anything I can get started on that wetland edge? Uh, I can try and take that one. Uh, it depends to some extent where you're at. I mean, I'm assuming you're in the, you know, the St. Croix River Valley. So if it's a, it's quite wet, you could try silver maple that plant and silver maple that can survive underneath the shade of some of the, those older aspens until they all die. Um, swamp white oak is a one that's gaining popularity, although that needs a little bit more sun, but it, it, it can often grow in the, in the understory if it's not too thick. Uh, those, those are probably the two best ones I could think of or, or well, high bush cranberry, if you're, it, you know, that that'll grow in wetter areas if you're, if you are willing to plant a shrub rather than a tree. So Great. that about well, covers it. Okay. Um, another question is, do foresters prefer to survey properties at a certain time of year? Uh, my personal preference is when there are no leaves because um, you can you can see a lot better and, and get around but um, the more realistic answer is whenever we can make time to get there <laughs> yeah. winter is nice because there's no bugs yeah mm -hmm. um, and also following up with that is harvesting best in the winter or summer uh, it it depends um, you know on what's your site uh, allows. There are some uh, financial advantages to harvesting in the summer, um, but there are also a lot of sites that just don't lend themselves to anything but harvesting on frozen ground. Um, and aspen generally regenerate a little bit better when they are harvested in the winter. Um, so it, uh, it's a catch-22. Yeah, if I can add a little bit you know, if you really want that dense aspen regen that, you know, that woodcock and, and rough grouse really like, then you, you want to cut it in the wintertime because then you'll get that really aggressive sprouting of aspen. If you cut it in the summertime, if the ground allows it, they don't sprout, sprout quite so aggressively. So that, that does allow some more diversity, some other species to come in. Great, thank you. And then talking about aspen, is, do, we want to ha do we want to harvest aspen before they die? Uh, it depends what your what your goals are. I I personally do um, on most sites, but if your goal is um, you know to convert the site more to northern hardwoods or a different forest type, then uh, letting them senesce um, could be an option. Um, but usually the you know you can expedite the process of converting to a different forest type uh, by implementing some timber harvest that is a little less heavy handed too. Um. Great. So it is um, essentially 2.30. So thank you both for speaking with us today. Um, and I see that you left your email in the chat box for people if they had uh, more questions for you guys. 
Um, so thank you for attending and thank you, thank you to our speakers. But this concludes the webinar for today. So thank you and have a nice day, all of y'all.